Today, we're going to be talking about murder or self-defense. First, let's talk about Stephen. He was born on January 1, 1995, and he grew up in the small town of Griffin, Georgia. He grew up with both of his parents, Jennifer and Troy, and his brother, Blake. He definitely had a happy childhood with a loving family around him and a large circle of friends, according to people that knew him. Everybody liked Stephen. One thing that a lot of people said about him is that he was constantly smiling and also would not hesitate to say, I love you a lot. From a young age, Stephen loved the outdoors. He always wanted to be outside, fishing, hunting, camping. His family actually said that he would outlive all of them, probably because he didn't carry a lot of stress. They say stress can kill you, but he was very laid back and seemed to never stress out about anything. Growing up, Stephen had a close relationship with both his parents, but especially with his mom, Jennifer. At one point, Jennifer went back to school later in her life, and Stephen wrote her this adorable note when she did. It says, to the most wonderful woman in the world. Know that if you put your mind to it, you can accomplish all of your hopes and dreams and more. I love you to the moon and back, Stephen. According to his mom, this was their special sign-off with each other. They would say, I love you to the moon and back. They had a very close, bonded relationship. Then, we have the other person in this story, Mary Catherine Higdon. She was born in 1994. Her family said that growing up, she was a very happy-go-lucky, playful, fun kid who was constantly performing for them, putting on little plays. She was always entertaining everybody in the room, and she's also very creative. She loved animals. One time, she walked a frog around her neighborhood that she found with a shoelace. And as you may have guessed, Mary Catherine and Stephen were dating. In fact, they were high school sweethearts. They have been together for a while, as soon as they met. They had so much in common that they quickly became inseparable. One passion that they both share is that they love the outdoors. They love to go camping, fishing, and hunting together. Mary is a pretty rugged type of girl. She is also into guns. She likes to hunt. She likes to get dirty, and he really loved that about her. He felt like they weren't just in a relationship, but that they had a strong friendship as well. As soon as they graduated high school, they moved into their own place in Griffin, Georgia. Stephen worked as a metal worker at Drainwright Gutters and Roofing, and Mary Catherine worked as a part-time teacher's assistant at St. George's Episcopal School in Milner, Georgia. She also worked at a local sporting goods store, selling guns. One of Stephen's best friends, Thomas Skinner, actually worked with her at the store for a while. He said that before selling guns, all employees were expected to know how to handle them. This was to make sure they didn't accidentally shoot them off in the store and to ensure that they could demonstrate them correctly to the customers. They learned to load and to shoot and basic gun safety rules as well. Mary Catherine definitely knew how to handle a gun, how to load a gun, and how to shoot a gun. Stephen was also a gun enthusiast and owned at least 10 guns. In fact, she and Stephen kept a Glock 42 in their home. Mary Catherine felt like she was actually even more into guns than Stephen was, and that she knew more about them. She would even brag about this to his friends. So, Stephen spent a lot of time with his really close friends at the time. Chase Pruitt, Thomas Skinner, and Andrew McKee. They were really close friends and they really cared about who each other was dating. When they met Mary Catherine, they were a bit hesitant. But as soon as they got to know her, they actually really liked her and they thought that she was perfect for him. They loved how outdoorsy she was and how happy she was making him. His friends thought it was really cool that she did so many things that he did as well. They just felt like they were a pretty good match. At first, Mary Catherine also got along with Stephen's family. His mother, Jennifer, really loved Mary Catherine and said that she considered her to be like a daughter. Mary Catherine would have dinner with them every Sunday night at Jennifer's house with Stephen's grandparents and extended family there as well. She was really part of their family. So, by the summer of 2018, 
Mary Catherine was 24, Stephen was 23, and they had been dating on and off for seven years at this point and still lived together in Griffin. But then, on August 1st, 2018, a call came into 911 at 10.42 p.m. about a shooting victim at a house on Sunnybrook Drive. Um, yes, ma'am, I actually am my done with Hayward, and I'm so sorry. I, I like, just tell my boyfriend in the night, I'm just sorry. Clearly, this woman was hysterical. There's been a lot of debate back and forth on this 911 call. Some people say the call sounds like she's genuinely very scared. Some people say the call sounds staged. But one thing's for sure. She said the words, I accidentally just shot my boyfriend. And that's really important. She had shot Stephen Freeman right in his chest, just below the neck, with her Glock 42. When the officers arrived at the scene, Mary Catherine was absolutely hysterical. According to people there, she could not be calmed down. No one there could get her to calm down. Stephen was lying on a mattress, and she was actually kneeling on the mattress next to him, just begging over and over for him to live through this for him to survive, saying, Please help me, please help me, over and over again. She was led away from the room. She kept yelling, I can't lose him. I can't lose him. And of course, this is debated. It's up to you what you think, but some people say this is very staged. It's very overdramatic. Some people say this is very genuine emotion that she's displaying. How did this happen? According to Mary, Mary Catherine says the gun just went off as she was handing it over to Stephen. She said that they keep it next to their bed for protection. She just lifted it up to hand it to him, and it accidentally went off. And she said she didn't even know that it was loaded when she picked it up. Apparently, their guns are typically not loaded in their house. She said she didn't understand how the bullet could possibly hit him, that she wasn't even really pointing it at him. And when they got to the scene, Stephen actually did still have a pulse. He was rushed to the hospital but, unfortunately, passed away a couple minutes before midnight. When he got there, right off the bat, officers on the scene said that they thought this was a homicide, not an accident. They took Mary Catherine in for interrogation. When they started talking to her, they started asking, How was your relationship? How are things going? How did this all happen? She starts explaining that she loved Stephen. He was the love of her life, and she would never, ever hurt him on purpose. She told them that the shooting was an accident. Just like what she said at the crime scene. But then she changed her story. She said that instead of just handing him the gun, she was tossing him the gun when it went off. But the detectives right away were not buying it. One of them specifically had enough experience with guns to know that it doesn't really work that way. When you throw a gun, it doesn't just go off. Someone needs to pull the trigger. There needs to be intention, especially to hit someone right there. The evidence at the crime scene definitely makes it seem like this was not an accident, that something was going down at that house before the gun went off. First of all, there was food all over, not just on the counters, like thrown. They had had some type of fight where food was thrown all around their kitchen. Not only that, they also smelled alcohol on her breath, which could mean there was an argument as well. Right away, they really don't believe her story, but they get her to agree to sit down and talk to them without a lawyer and to have it all on tape. As the interrogation went on, they kept pushing her to tell the truth. They just did not believe the story that she was just tossing him the gun, that it was all an accident. They believed a fight happened and something went wrong. At one point, the detectives really started yelling at her. They said this is an interrogation technique, but they started screaming at her to stop lying, to tell the truth. And this tactic actually worked. Mary Catherine admitted that she did it and that she did it out of anger. It was all on tape. You might think at that point, case closed. Why are we even talking about this case today? Well, because there was a major technical difficulty after they had already arrested her on this confession and charged her with murder. They go to review the tape and guess what? 
It is absolutely useless. Pretty much all you can hear is feedback noise, and they had no backup audio. They didn't have a little recorder in their pockets. Nothing. All they have now is their word of the two detectives that were in the room versus Mary Catherine's word. After all those hours and getting her to confess, the interrogation was useless. Now, this was definitely the best evidence that they had, but it wasn't the only evidence. There was evidence that the gun had been loaded that night. Mary Catherine had cooked a London broil for dinner, which is very greasy. This was what officers found thrown on the floor. But they found that cooking grease on the magazine and the side of the gun, showing that someone had loaded it after cooking dinner. It also came out that police had been to their residence five times in the past year, and two of those times were definitely for domestic disputes. One of them apparently was an issue related to animals. The more details that they started to uncover, the more they leaned towards homicide. They started interviewing people closest to Mary Catherine and Stephen, including Stephen's friends. All of Stephen's friends instantly said that they thought that Mary Catherine did it. According to them, she was possessive and very unstable. They said that she was very verbally abusive to Stephen, that she was constantly yelling at him, and that they were constantly yelling at each other. Whenever he would leave the house to try to get away from her, to get a break from her if they were fighting, she would call him, text him over and over again until he would have to block her. One time, he was at work. He was in the car with a co-worker, and they were driving to a job together. She called him, according to the co-worker, over 30 times while they were in the car. Some mornings, several different occasions, he would get to work, and before we even got to the first job, he'd have 30 missed calls from her, like she was just blowing him off the line. All of his friends said that Stephen was afraid of Mary Catherine. They said that she had pulled a gun on him before, and that he had told all of them about it. And not just once, three or four times she had pulled her gun out. All of them said when they heard that Stephen had been shot, their minds instantly went to Mary Catherine. The police are at that time gathering evidence, putting together a timeline, and getting ready for trial. They hoped to get justice for Stephen and for his family, who was absolutely devastated that he had passed. Going over the timeline of their relationship, from what the police were able to put together, leading up to the night that Stephen was shot. On April 21, 2018, three months before Stephen was killed, he texted his friend Andrew and said, MK is running around screaming at the top of her lungs outside, and now she's trying to shoot me and herself. Then, a few weeks later, Stephen tells a friend that Mary Catherine had pointed a gun at him. He specifically said that when he looked in her eyes, she had a specific look. She looked like she might actually shoot him. That wasn't just for show, just because they were fighting. He really thought she wanted to kill him in that moment. After this happened, he went to a friend's house and got a break from her. But he didn't end up reporting it to the police because he really loved Mary Catherine and didn't want her to get in trouble. Things were toxic with them for a while. They fought a lot, and in July of 2018, it seemed that Stephen may have been ready to actually leave her. According to his friend Thomas, Stephen had definitely made the decision by July that he was going to move out. He was actually planning to move to a different town and just not tell her because that's how afraid of her he was. He was going to do this while she was at work, just basically sneak away. He had actually planned to leave on August 3rd, 2018, which is two days after he was shot and killed. On July 30th, just two days before he was shot, Stephen and Mary Catherine actually exchanged some loving text messages. They said, good morning, beautiful, and then she said, have a great day. And he said, you too, love you. But that's how their relationship was, hot and cold. That's how most toxic relationships are, going back and forth between the two extremes. So the next day, they got into a fight, and it was so bad that Stephen said he just wasn't coming home. He actually told his friend that he was running from Satan, so that tells you how afraid of her he was. So the next night, she made him a nice dinner, a London broil one of his favorites. She hoped that he would come home. 
They would have dinner together, talk it out, and continue on like they always did. But Stephen didn't come home, and he would not answer her calls that night. Later, when she was questioned about this, she said that she just was irritated that she had made this meal and he wasn't coming back. She just wanted to know if she should start eating without him or not, and that's why she was calling him off the hook. She even went as far as to call Stephen's mom, Jennifer, and his mom said that he was over at his friend Thomas's house. Of course, she jumps in her car and heads off to find him. Stephen and Thomas had already left his house and were driving around in his truck. This is some real crazy stuff. But Mary Catherine spotted the truck somehow and started following them. Thomas said she was right up on his bumper and that she eventually pulled up to the side of the car and started screaming out the window, saying, Are you coming home now? His friend said Stephen looked like he had given up and he said, Yes, I'm coming home. Will you calm down? And then, two hours later, Stephen was shot. So, it's pretty obvious what happened. Stephen probably went home to end things with Mary Catherine. She didn't like the fact that they weren't going to just have this nice dinner that she made for him and move on. So, she threw the food on the floor, got her gun. Who knows what else exactly happened, but at some point, she clearly shot him. The fact that he was telling his friends multiple times that she had pointed a gun at him, and he was scared for his life, definitely makes you think twice about her. When you think about it, it just all makes sense. She really is very familiar with how to use guns. For her to say she just accidentally discharged it when she's learned all this stuff about gun safety in her life, it's just extremely hard to believe. But of course, when it came time for the trial, she had completely changed her story again. She was going to be pleading not guilty, and she claimed that she had to shoot Stephen in self-defense. Mary Catherine was charged with murder, aggravated assault, and possession of a firearm during a commission of a felony. She was offered a plea deal of life in prison with the possibility of parole, but she did not take this, and the case went to trial. The trial wasn't too long. It only took about a week for them to present both sides. Mary Catherine was represented by public defenders, and they argued that this was self-defense. They said that Mary Catherine was afraid of Stephen because of his history of abuse. Since the prosecution did not have the confession tape anymore, they had to rely mostly on physical evidence, which isn't too much in this case. But the fact that there was grease on the gun was huge. It showed that it had been loaded, so that was a big part of their argument. They also brought in Stephen's friends as witnesses, of course, because they were so familiar with how the relationship was according to Stephen. And of course, when you go to trial, everything comes out. All of their text messages, search histories, their conversations with each other over long periods of time. But they also, in a very risky move, had Mary Catherine take the stand. This was pretty intense. She told a completely different story of their relationship. She alleges that she had suffered every type of abuse from Stephen for years. She said he had a very controlling and manipulative side that not many people knew about, and he made her act a certain way. She couldn't help but get extremely emotional and heated at times because of the way he pushed her. According to her, he was also very controlling and had to know where she was at all times, what she spent money on, what she was eating, and what she was doing. Of course, these are all her words. It's hard with these cases where the victim is not here to speak for themselves or defend themselves in any way, but this is what she argued in court. She also said that one time, while she was sitting on her bed, Stephen kicked her incredibly hard and actually pushed her forward off the bed. Her head hit their door frame really, really hard. She said she never called the police because she would end up blaming herself, thinking she had pushed him that far to abuse her. The defense also recovered a bunch of text messages between the two of them, and they're not pretty. In fact, there were 63 pages of very vulgar, threatening, and scary messages from Stephen to Mary Catherine that were sent the year before. Apparently, these messages are so brutal that the news hasn't revealed a lot of them. Many haven't been shared with the public because they're so bad. In one message, 
He even sent a picture of himself holding up a dead fish and said, This is you, girl. In another message, he said, I'm going to really wreck you for wrecking me, referring to her cheating on him. At one point, she did cheat on him, and he just went crazy over it. He was so angry. Stephen's mom says that she had no idea he was talking to a woman this way. She's not proud of the way he was talking, but she said that this was out of anger. I think we've all been in a position before where someone has really hurt us, and we've said something mean to them that we don't truly mean. Not that it makes what he said okay in any way, it's very abusive, but at the same time, I don't know if it can be used as proof that she needed to shoot him in self-defense. One of the messages he sent her even said, The more stuff you talk, the more you get punished when I get home. When the court asked what he meant by punish, she said that he would slap her, grab her, and punch her. She said that he would scream at her, saying, Why can't you just listen to me and do the things that I tell you? Why can't you be better? He, you know, smacked me around. Sometimes he would grab me and, and shake me and say, you know, why can't you just do better and be better and just do what I tell you to do? So at any time I'd stand up for myself or I'd, you know, kind of retaliate. He said, don't, don't hit me because if you hit me, I'm going to hit you 10 times harder. Mary Catherine explained as much as she could about the relationship. She described how it was really controlling and toxic. When it was good, it was really good. But when it was bad, it was just bad. Then they revealed that Stephen had a red room, according to Mary Catherine, similar to the one in Fifty Shades of Grey. Mary Catherine said that they would use this room and that he would take her in there and punish her in the red room. This is when she made a huge accusation, and everyone in the court was kind of shocked and not expecting this. She said that Stephen had raped her twice. Now, of course, Stephen is not here to defend himself. So we have to go off of her word, and there's really no way to know if she's telling the truth or not. She said that on one of these occasions, they had just gotten back from a trip to Walt Disney World. They had a great time at Disney, came back, and had sex. Mary Catherine claims that he was being really aggressive, and she wanted him to stop and asked him several times to stop. According to her, he said, I bought you all this stuff at Disney World, so you have to do what I tell you. You have to give me what I deserve. And then, according to her, he raped her. She claimed that the night Stephen died went completely differently than the police thought. She said she broke up with him after making the London broil for him. Then he got really angry, freaked out, and started throwing things and screaming. Even though two hours before this, he was fleeing from her, and she was chasing him with her car. She said that he kept getting angrier and angrier, and eventually, she picked up the gun and pointed it at him to scare him. She said her last words to him were, Get the heck out of my house. And then he lunged at her. All she can remember is the gun going off. She said he was standing there bleeding, still conscious, and he said, Call 911, and then fell down. However, while she was on the stand, she didn't specifically talk about pulling the trigger. She just talked about the lunge, and then it all happened as a blur. Mary Catherine said that she originally lied to the police because she was just embarrassed to be a victim. Mary Catherine's sister also took the stand and backed her up, saying that she was being abused by Stephen. She said there were bruises on her weeks before all this happened. Mary Catherine said that he had just grabbed her too hard, but she knew something more was going on. Now, Let's talk about the forensic evidence. The forensic evidence showed that Mary Catherine had shot him while he was sitting on the corner of their mattress. He had never even moved. He was sitting when he was shot and fell back. Of course, they called up Stephen's friends, and they all testified that she was the abusive one in the relationship, not Stephen. Which is hard because he did write those messages, and they are horrible. But according to them, she was physically and verbally abusive to him as well. Apparently, she would hit him in the face, in the chest, and punch him in his shoulder. They said they never saw Stephen hit her. That one time she slapped him, he grabbed her and said not to hit him again. And that was all they ever saw as far as physical action against her. 
Of course, things can happen behind the scenes without friends seeing it. They also pointed out the obvious. She had worked with guns before and had gun safety lessons. She should know how to operate a gun. It's very hard to believe that she would accidentally shoot one off. She was constantly bragging to people about how good she was with guns, and then she accidentally misfires one. It doesn't really add up. Of course, the defense said that Stephen's friends never actually saw her abusing him with their own eyes. They don't have proof of it. They also don't have proof of her confession, obviously. So according to their side, she never confessed. They also allege that Stephen had a drug and alcohol use problem which contributed to his violent behavior. The prosecution brought up another very important text message. It was recovered from Stephen's phone and said, I know you pointed a gun at me a bunch of times, but the last time you did it, it scared the heck out of me. But Mary Catherine said this was about shooting herself. Mary Catherine often would threaten to commit suicide, and that's one of the reasons Stephen's mother believes he stayed in the relationship so long because Mary Catherine would threaten to harm herself if he left. The prosecution also noted that Mary Catherine had slightly altered or completely changed her story at least ten times. She had told everybody something different. She told the 911 operator that she was grabbing the gun and putting it next to the bed. She told the first responders that she was handing it to Stephen. Then she told the detectives that she had tossed it over to him and it accidentally went off. Her story constantly changed. But of course, the fact remains that all of her interrogation footage is completely ruined and not usable. Not only that, the murder weapon was also tampered with at the scene. First responders had actually moved the gun because they were worried that Mary Catherine might pick it up and shoot herself, which is understandable, but they should have just moved her away from the gun. No one should ever touch a crime scene, especially the weapon. The worst part is they didn't even take pictures of the gun in its original position before they moved it. They just moved it. It's very frustrating because it's not like they came to the scene thinking it was a suicide or something. She said on the phone, I shot him. They should have known to handle the weapon and process it correctly. It makes no sense. This is like the number one rule. Of course, because Mary Catherine took the stand, she was also cross-examined. She was grilled about never reporting the abuse, never talking to anyone about it, and never texting anyone about it. It was very rare that she talked to anyone about it, and she always spoke to people, not texted. Then they brought up the fact that just hours before the shooting happened, she was actually babysitting. While she was babysitting, she was looking up really violent adult content on the computer. She claims that this was all done because she was getting ideas about what Stephen was into and wanted to please him. They argued that there's no way someone who had experienced the sexual trauma that Mary Catherine was claiming to have would be looking up these horribly violent videos. In closing arguments, they reminded the jury that Mary Catherine had changed her story many times. They also brought up the fact that it's unlikely that if she was being abused, she would track down her abuser in their car and force them to come home. It just didn't really add up. They said that their relationship finally hit a boiling point, literally, when she made that London broil and he wasn't interested in having dinner with her. He probably told her he was planning to leave. In the defense's closing arguments, they talked about how Mary Catherine had seen a look on Stephen's face that reminded her of when he would abuse her. They actually brought in a jack-in-the-box and used it to make the point that when you know what's coming as you're winding it up, you're going to have a reaction. You're going to prepare to defend yourself because you know the figure is going to jump out of the jack-in-the-box. It's a pretty weak comparison to see what they were going for. But anyway, what you think the verdict is going to be at this point in the video. So pause it and comment below. This jury has seven women and five men. And in the first few minutes of their deliberation, they took a vote. It was 10 to 2 for guilty. The two jurors voting not guilty were men, and they were struggling because they felt like no matter what they did, they would destroy a family. It's a lot of pressure to be a juror. All of the jurors said that they knew for sure that she had lied and that she had shot him, 
but it was that gray area of self-defense that kept them from staying guilty. The jury talked back and forth about abusive relationships and whether she would be used to lying or not. They deliberated for hours after this initial vote, but then the following day, they came to their final verdict. Mary Catherine was found not guilty on all charges. We, the jury, find as follows. Count one, malice murder. We find the defendant not guilty. Count two, felony murder. We find the defendant not guilty. <laughs> Stephen's family was absolutely crushed, and the whole prosecution was crushed as well. They felt like they had let his family down. All the jury members said that they thought she did it, but there was not enough evidence to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Do you think there's enough evidence beyond a reasonable doubt? Thanks for listening to this episode. We'll be back next time, of course, to bring you yet another case. But until then, stay safe out there and please subscribe.